Yeah. What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to Believe in the Mommy. He brought to you by the Believe Network. As always, I'm your host, Anthony DiNardo. And once again, I am live streaming on the YouTube channel. If you're on the audio side and you want to watch me talk live and get your questions answered, just search Anthony DiNardo on YouTube. And to everyone that's tuned into the live stream, I do appreciate y'all. Make sure to drop y'all questions down below. And we're going to go ahead and get into a lot of those as we uh, start talking. Let me go ahead and put this up. Uh, recording podcast live. Let's get it. Okay, anyways, it's been an interesting last week for the Miami Heat as you had the NBA trade deadline close in which deja vu, the Miami Heat once again did nothing. Except this year, I do feel like a lot of Heat fans were kind of split on how they feel on the subject. Last year, the Heat weren't doing so high and everyone was saying, oh, how do you not make a move? How do you not try to sell Gabe Vincent? How do you not try to sell Max Drews? Well, it's because those guys actually ended up being key pieces on their way to an NBA Finals run. So I sit here today as a Heat fan and say, am I mad? Am I annoyed that Pat Riley was asleep behind the wheel? Am I annoyed that Mickey Harrison was doing his cheap tendencies is how I like to put it light, uh, lightly. I don't know. I actually just dropped the video earlier today begging the question, are the Miami Heat better than last year? If you want my full explanation, make sure to go check out that video but to kind of sum it up, I think they are. Now, it's weird to say that because they actually have a slightly worse winning percentage at this time of the season than they did last year. Last year, they were like 30 and 25. That's a 54% winning percentage. This year, they're like 28 and 24, which is only like a 53% winning percentage. So on paper, they're slightly worse. But I do think the additions of Jaime Jaquez, who's been struggling of late, but as he'll start to get his, his role more defined with everyone healthy, I do think he'll get more comfortable and we'll see, you know, a similar efficiency to what we saw earlier. We were not going to see the same production because he was starting playing 40 minutes a night before. But I do think we'll start to get to see that efficiency back because he was a very efficient player from the field and from three. So because of Jaime Jaquez alone, I think this team is better because truthfully, I think he's better than Gabe and Max Struess were last year. But you also got another season of Kevin Love, this time from the jump. I really like what he's done this season. And of course, probably the biggest addition or improvement is the improvement from Terry Rozier to Kyle Lowry. So I kind of think I want to start this video uh, in this podcast kind of talking about Terry Rozier because in the video that I posted earlier today, I was critical of Terry Rozier. Not so much critical of him, but I was just saying, when are we going to stop giving him a pass and stop saying, oh, this is still a small sample size? Because we're talking a nine game sample size now and his numbers are like under 40% from the field, under 30% from three. And those are horrendous efficiencies. And I'm watching all these moves, make these trades on the deadline. And the Miami Heat made their move. They made their move except reality. That's what we're all saying on Heat Twitter, right? But if that move does not work, they're in some trouble. Because Miami Heat had two tradable first round picks. They traded one of them to get some more scoring because that was an issue of theirs. They brought in Terry Rozier who's supposed to fix the scoring or, or be a scorer. And he has not done that yet. Now, Obviously, his playmaking has been pretty nice. You haven't seen as much pick and roll as you, as I would have liked to see, but I think that's sort of nitpicking. But he's still, he's getting his five or six assists a game. I like what he's bringing on the defensive end, you know, given expectations. But his shooting efficiency is terrible. And some nights he doesn't want to shoot. Some nights he's forcing shots, taking long fadeaway twos, and it's frustrating because I'm scared that if this does not work out, the Miami Heat are in trouble. Now, he's worlds better than Kyle Lowry at the end of the day because at least Terry Rozier can get to the rim. Kyle Lowry can't do that. And I'll say I am willing to give Rozier until after the All-Star break. That's another week to kind of get used to his role and kind of get things going. But if his efficiency stays this bad, I can't expect the Miami Heat to go past the second or third round. You know, Maybe even the first, depending where they are. Because this team might be in the play and They might be another A seed and have to get matched with the Celtics. So who knows, right? But they got him to be a scorer. He's got to get the efficiency up. And the reason uh, that I'm kind of being critical of him is because I don't like how a lot of people have said, oh, he'll come back around. He'll get his shooting together. Will he? I don't know. Because what I've seen at Terry Rozier so far on my team has not been what we were hoping for. Now, I wasn't hoping that he'd shoot, you know, or score 24 points a night on, on high efficiency like he was with Charlotte. But I was sure as hell expecting more than 40% from the field and more than 25% from three. 
because I think he's going to be a big piece if this team actually is better than last year, and I just haven't seen that yet. But I guess we can kind of talk more about the trade deadline first. I kind of got a, a, a list of a few points here I want to get to of everything that we saw in the last week, uh, but a little more on the trade deadline because I did have a, an entire video on that as well. The biggest moves, I guess, everyone wants to talk about Bohan Bogdanovich for good reason. He definitely made the Knicks the winners of the trade deadline, in my opinion, because the fact that the Knicks had eight tradable first-round picks and had to give up zero of them for Alec Burks and Bohan Bogdanovich is crazy. I don't know if that's just the Pistons being stupid. I don't know if that's us thinking that Bohan's market was much bigger than it was because he is 34, turning 35 years old. He's on the older side, but a guy who's still scoring 17 points per night on extremely efficient volumes from three, you would think they could have got at least a first round pick from him, especially from the Knicks who have a, an eight to trade, you know? So they won the trade down, in my opinion, uh, especially when you take into account they just got OG Ananobi a few weeks ago. They've been dominant since. Now, Julius Randle's out with the, the dislocated shoulder. OG Ananobi's going to miss like another three weeks, they said. But that Knicks team still hasn't slowed down. And in the meantime, they got Bohan Bogdanovich to start at the four or start at the three, wherever they want to start him until those other guys get back. So I don't think they're going to sink at all like a lot of us thought they might once they got those injuries. But at the end of the day, when that team is healthy, I'm not going to lie, they scare me slightly. Now, obviously, the Miami Heat took care of them last season, but that team with the additions of Ananobi and Bohan, I think they are very much so improved. Now, I don't want to discount Emmanuel quickly and R.J. Baird, who those were good plays for them too, but just fit-wise, I think the pieces that the Knicks have fit so well. You got a guy who I believe is a superstar in Jalen Brunson. You got the the defensive stalwart, uh, perennial, perfect 3 and D player in Ananobi. You got the power forward, now you, who's not the best three-point shooter. But now you got Bohan Bogdanovich that you can slide in the starting lineup somehow too, who's elite at that. I just love their fits. I don't want to sit here and talk about how scared I am of the Knicks because they seem to be the New York Knicks every year and somehow fail. But I do like the moves that they made. Some of the other moves that I like, another Eastern Conference contender, the Boston Celtics, they got Xavier Tillman for two second round picks. I would have loved him here. Very nice, you know, big body. He's going to be a great back of the big for them. I wish that he could have did something like that. The Minnesota Timberwolves, they got Monty Morris for a second round pick. The Miami Heat don't have a backup point guard. They could have used him. What else do we got? The Buddy Heald one to Philly, I don't like as much personally because I don't think Joel Embiid will play this season. I know they said he'll try to come back in a month or so, but I mean, I just watched Jalen Ramsey with the Miami Dolphins miss like four months with the same meniscus tear, and he came back early. So they saying Joel Embiid is going to come back in a month to two months. That's already a guy that has trouble staying in shape. Like, how the hell is he going to take two months off from physical activity and then be ready for a playoff push. I, I don't see it happening. And Buddy Hill's a guy that's on the last year of his contract, I believe. So it's kind of like they're bringing in Buddy Hill for a run. But without Embiid, they're not going to make a run. And so who knows? Maybe they'll be able to retain Buddy Hill. I don't know. But I just think it would have made more sense for the 76ers to kind of hold in their chips for this offseason when you do know you'll have Joel Embiid back and you can kind of reevaluate your situation then. But then again, they didn't give up any first-round picks. They traded three second-round picks for Buddy Hill. So... Second round picks have gotten some more value recently, but they're not as high as they were last year when you saw Jay Crowder going for five first round picks, which was just absolutely nuts. Uh, we also saw another Eastern Conference contender make a move. The Milwaukee Bucks got Patrick Beverly. The Milwaukee Bucks, since getting Damian Lillard, have sucked on the defensive end, particularly on the perimeter defense. So what did they do? They went out and got one of the better perimeter defenders in the league. They had a problem. They made a trade to fix it. What a concept to Miami Heat. Miami's sitting here playing six, seven guys, and their tallest player is a six, nine bam. And when he comes out of the game, they got no size. But Miami made no moves to fix that. I, I don't I don't get it. I, I really don't get it. They have second round picks. They had two tradable trade uh tradable second round picks. They couldn't have gone out there and got somebody. I don't know. That's kind of what I was uh the frustration that I was portraying in the video I posted earlier today is I'm annoyed with the front office. I really am. But the th same things that I'm saying now, I said last season too. So it's like, I, I don't know what to say. I it's like, I I'm willing to give this team the benefit of the doubt. But on paper, they're making moves or their lack thereof don't quite make a lot of sense. 
But at the end of the day, the same teams that I'm scared about, the Miami Heat beat their ass last year. So I'm going to see how things go playoff time. But regardless, it's it's obvious and it's not debatable that this Heat team has holes that they need to address immediately. And now they can't make no moves. We, we'll talk about the buy market a little bit. But if things still aren't fixed, because they're only 28 and 24, that's not a great record, okay? Maybe it's time to consider putting Tyler Hero back to the bench unit or even Terry Rozier because that starting backcourt I don't think is great. <laughs> I don't think that's worked very well. I want to give them some more time together before I fully give my thoughts on it or maybe make a, a whole video about it. But I'd like to kind of see some pr improvements there, which we've seen Tyler Hero be more of a facilitator of late, but it's been a couple games. Uh, he even missed the one game with the, the migraine. So let's give them a couple more games. But if things aren't fixed, you got to make a move in the starting lineup. If not, they got some buyout guys that they could look at. I made a, a video about that as well. Uh, the top of my list is a guy I'm not hearing a lot about. It's Patty Mills. I mean, he's a veteran uh, championship pedigree point guard. Low mistake. Very efficient. I just think in the buyout market where anybody you get is theoretically not going to be a, a rotation player, Patty Mills is at least a guy that has a few very nice qualities. I think second on the list, I had Gallinari, who is a great shooter, great stretch shooter, but terrible at defense. He's really only bringing some floor spacing. Uh, I think third on that list, I have DeLon Wright, who wasn't even bought out yet. He may or may not get bought out, but he's a very good perimeter defender. Not much else. Fourth, I had Thaddeus Young, really just because he's a nice locker room guy, has some experience because he's not even that big. I've heard a lot of people say that Thaddeus Young provides size. He's the same height as Kevin Love and weighs 20 pounds less. It surprised me, but I looked it up, and it's true. Uh, and I think fifth on that list, I just had Furkan Korkmaz. Very good shooter. And again, he, he could be a guy that maybe you put him in a playoff game and he gets hot, or, or you have a Josh Richardson out, you could put him for uh, Furkan Korkmaz, and you always have the chance that he gets hot. You know, Same with Danilo Gallinari, who actually, with the Pistons, is shooting like 50% from three. So he's not as washed as a lot of people think. Now, he obviously still has a lot of injury concerns, but it kind of is what it is there. Uh, I think I want to get into my, my list of my rest of my notes here. I do want to say to everyone on the stream, make sure to like and subscribe and drop y'all comments down below. I'll get all your questions answered if we do have any uh, when I kind of get through all these points because that's kind of the point of doing these live streams. I like to make it as interactive as possible. Uh, so feel free to leave y'all thoughts down below. Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, the first uh, thing that we got here is about Hayward Highsmith. We heard that he was out for personal reasons and it was very unfortunate when we found out why. If anyone hasn't heard, maybe you're not on Twitter. Apparently, this is all the detail we have so far, by the way. Apparently, Hayward Highsmith was driving on the highway, and there was a guy you know, walking on the highway trying to push a car that was stalled, and that car did not have his headlights on. Hayward Highsmith was going 45 miles per hour in a 40-mile-per-hour zone, so I guess maybe not the highway, but point is, he really wasn't speeding. Technically, he was, so... I heard there was uh, no charges being pressed. If there was, I wonder if Hayward would technically be in the blame because he was speeding. But we all go 45 in, in a 40, right? You know what I mean? But point is, Hayward wasn't speeding. He wasn't under the influence or anything like that. And unfortunately, he didn't have enough time to see the guy and get out of the way. So he did hit the guy with his car. He had a part of his leg amputated. He was in critical condition. And I haven't heard anything since. So... First and foremost, I hope everyone involved is okay, particularly the guy that got hit. Hayward didn't sustain any injuries, so we do want to, you know, keep that guy in our thoughts and prayers, make sure everything's okay with him first and foremost, but that's basically all I got to say. I don't have an opinion on it because I don't know exactly what happened, but that's the story that we heard so far, and I do believe Hayward Highsmith is likely to play tomorrow or Sunday, whenever you're watching this. Super Bowl Sunday versus the Boston Celtics. Uh, the next point I got here is about Kelly Olynyk. There was a rumor before the trade deadline that the Heat were interested in him. Obviously, they didn't end up getting him. He ended up going to the Toronto Raptors. And Heat fans, I feel like, overwhelmingly wanted Kelly Olynyk. And my question is, why? Like, the positives. He was a great guy, right? He could shoot the ball a little bit. He was crafty at times. What the hell else was he doing? Because the thing that frustrated me the most about Kelly Olenek is how damn slow he was. And every time the Heat would go zone and the opposing team would swing the ball to the corner, I'm watching Kelly Olenek try his best to run out to the corner and contest, but he's too damn slow. So all he was doing was giving up open three after open three. And then Kelly Olenek's a good shooter, sure, right? 
But every three he took, his feet weren't set. He's fading to the left. He's fading to the right. And I'm like, you seven feet. Why the hell are you fading? Catch the ball. Square up. You know, bend your knees. Follow through. Make the damn shot. I don't need all this tipsy turny style stuff like you're Steph Curry. You're not Kelly Olenek. God, he was a frustrating player. Uh, anyways, I don't have to worry about it. Uh, the last few games we had this week, of course, the Heat lost to the Clippers. I was at that game. If y'all didn't see, I posted a vlog about it. A lot of people like my vlogs. They don't get as many views because it's not sort of a trending topic, but a lot of people do like them. It's kind of something different than my normal videos, so go check that out. But anyways, I, the Heat had 85 points with a minute to go and then somehow scored 10 points in the last minute of like garbage time. So do I regret going to that game? No, because I had a good time with my friends and girlfriend. But is it annoying spending a lot of money and driving from Fort Myers all the way to Miami and back in the same day to watch the team put 85 points? Yeah, it's frustrating. Maybe that's why I'm disappointed in Terry Rozier because he was cheeks that game too. But the Heat did bounce back with an amazing win versus the Orlando Magic, arguably one of their best, most you know co cohesive wins of the season. And then they did get the win versus Spurs the next night. Close game, but kind of pulled away towards the end. I think Jimmy Butler had a triple double that game. And they went on, they went into the trade deadline on a two game winning streak, back to back nights. Sort of a feel good thing. And now they got three days off going into the game on Sunday versus the Boston Celtics. That game will be a true test, a true measuring stick game to really see if this team is legit or not. Because if they get their ass kicked, I am not going to be a happy guy. I'm not. Now, we did hear Jimmy Butler may or may not be out for personal reasons. We don't know what the issue is there, but he's currently listed as questionable. So I do want to note that and say that I hope everything is okay there. The only other little bit of Heat news that we got was the Heat waived RJ Hampton and signed Alondis Williams from the G League roster. Of course, he's just going to be a two-way guy, so he may or may not see the floor sometime soon. Now, of course, I'm not watching Sioux Falls Sky Force games. I'm not going to lie to you. But his kind of thing is that he's supposedly, I, I heard that he's supposedly a defender. But I also know that he scored 55 points one game. He's averaging like 30 points in the last five. So for a guy that's very clearly a bucket, but he's also known as a defender, is this guy not like the greatest player of all time? I was, I was reading a little bit of a, a summary on him from uh, an article by Playbook Sports. Make sure y'all go check that out on Twitter. And they even said that he was a really nice facilitator. So I'm like, what the hell is this guy's weakness? You know, now I think I saw he was like a 27% three-point shooter. So I'm assuming a lot of his buckets are coming from inside. But regardless, if you got a guy that's averaging like 30 points per game and is not a turnstile on defense, sign me the hell up. Especially for RJ Hampton, who I thought was terrible here. I mean, he just looked very clunky offensively. He was very clumsy. Not a fan of what I've seen from RJ Hampton. Uh, I guess the I guess this is also kind of heat news. We found out that Jame Jaquez Jr. Kame Jame Jaquez will be in the dunk contest. Those participants will be uh, Jame Jaquez Toppin. I didn't write the first name, but I know it's not. At first, I thought it was Obi Toppin, but it's his brother. Something with a J, like James Toppin, uh, and then Jalen Brown, and of course, Mac McClung. I'm not one of those people that really cares that much about All-Star Weekend just because it sucks every year. Every year we get hype and it's always a letdown, particularly the dunk contest. Am I excited to see Hame? Sure. Am I nervous that he's going to embarrass himself? Also, yes. But the one thing that I kind of do feel strongly about is I don't think it's fair to have G League players in the dunk contest. Like it's the NBA dunk contest, not the G League dunk contest. There actually is a G League dunk contest. So if Toppin's brother and Mac McClung want to be in that, then be in that. But if you're not in the NBA, you shouldn't be allowed in the NBA dunk contest. That being said, I'm sure those boys are going to be better than Jalen Brown and Jame Hawkins because the best dunkers in the world are not in the NBA. So if they wanted to change it to just a basketball dunk contest instead of an NBA dunk contest, then fine. Bring those guys in. Bring in Jordan Kilgannon and all those other competitive dunkers because they're better than the NBA guys. And truthfully, I think you'd get a better show because truthfully, the guys in the NBA are not dunkers. That's why the, the thing is, they're basketball players, not dunkers. Obviously, they can dunk, but for, for the most part, none of them are as creative as a lot of these competitive dunkers and for good reason because they're working on their game. They're not working on their dunk entertainment value. You know what I mean? So I just didn't really like that. We also did get the uh, the three-point contest participants. Uh, that list will be Malik Beasley, Jalen Brunson, Tyrese Halliburton, Dame Dalla, Lowry Markkinen, Donovan Mitchell, Carl Anthony Towns, and Trey 
Young. Uh, Three-point contest, usually the best of the, the bunch that night. If I had to pick off the bat here, I'd probably say that Malik Beasley was. I don't know. I've seen that boy get hot a lot. He doesn't necessarily play as much as the other guys. So maybe he's really been working on his, you know, getting the ball off the racks and shooting. So I'll say Malik Beasley wins, but truthfully, I, I don't really care that all that much. Uh, I think that's really all I got to say as far as things that happened in the last week. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the stream here and get to any of these comments that we got here. Uh, let me see what we got here. Shout out to my guy, Hia Leo, or my girl. Uh, can't tell. Their profile picture is just a heat jersey. Zoomed in way too much. Uh, Erwin Valerio says Thad Young and Dylan, Dylan, uh, Danilo Gallinari are good buyout signings. You know, I love my boy. I didn't even mention it. My Italian brethren, uh, uh, Danilo Gallinari. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, Dig Dog Fit T says, bro, you talking about you upset with the front office. That's on Spo. Play the guys. He don't like playing bigs. Well, it's interesting you say that. He also says it's annoying when you put blame on the front office. Uh, Dig Dog 15, I guarantee you, you will not find a single person that agrees with you on that. This front office has done a terrible job building a team around Jimmy Butler. They, they really, really have. Now, how much of a say does Spo have when picking players? Probably a lot. He's been here a long time. Maybe he's the reason that they waited so long to get someone or didn't trade for someone else or got Thomas Bryant. I don't know. But if he did have a say, then that's on him too. But if you're talking about him not playing bigs, what do you want him to do? Give Thomas Bryant 30 minutes a night? Give Orlando Robinson 30 minutes a night? If those guys were good, they would play. If there's one person that I'm not going to tell how to do their job, it's Eric Spolstra. Now, the, the front office, they get slack because for them to go into this season without a single point guard on the roster, because we know Kyle Lowry sucked. We know Drew Smith sucked. They had zero point guards. I can't excuse that. Uh, we got Van Lee saying, do you like the new change where Jimmy starts the fourth? That's an excellent point, my guy. Last game versus Spurs, Jimmy started the fourth quarter. I thought that was very interesting. And off of one game, I'll say I liked it because the Heat had a very good fourth quarter. I know one of the things that we found the most frustrating is a lot of times Spo would wait and wait and wait to bring Jimmy in around the six-minute mark, sometimes the five-minute mark. And by that time, a big lead either shrank or a small deficit got out of hand. So if starting Jimmy in the fourth means that you can kind of put yourself in a good position when there's four or five minutes to go, then it does make sense to me. But we'll kind of have to see how if that's something Spo even continues going forward. Uh, Mohamedou says our simple solution to fix this season is very simple. Uh, just more of Jovic and Hayward into one player and start them. I wish because Hayward is all defense. I don't want to say no offense. He got a strap. But obviously, Jovic is pretty decent at offense and not that great a uh, defender. Uh, Van Lee got a very good question here again. He says, what matchup do you want for us first round of the playoffs? It seems as though it will be Celtics 1 and Cavs 2 for sure. I don't know if I'll say for sure. Uh, I will pull up the NBA standings real quick and see how kind of close everything is here. But to my knowledge, it's pretty close enough where things could change. I mean, the Bucks are three games back of the Cavs. Wow. Yeah, I guess ever since the Bucks got that bum-ass Doc Rivers, and they're like 2-5 and five now, They've slipped a little bit, uh, but either way, things are fluid. And even the Miami Heat, they're tied for six right now. They're three back of five with Philly, who obviously is going to lose a lot of games with Joel Embiid out. But if you're asking me really anyone ahead of us, who would I want to play? Well, I'm not going to say Philly because I, I think they'll slip out a little bit. But if you're asking me right now, I guess between the Celtics, Cavs, and Bucks. I don't know, man. The Cavaliers, though, they just got so much size on that team. Between Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, I don't think the Heat match up very well with them. But we saw last year the lights were too bright. Is it the same this year? I don't know. I, I, I guess I probably would rather say the Cavs still. They just got not a, as much firepower as those other two teams. And if not the Cavs, may, maybe the Bucks, Because uh, I, I really think the Celtics got a, got a great roster. I think the Heat can still beat them. But if I had to pick probably choose the Cavaliers. Uh, Vlackout says, what do you think about Rozier defensively? Can our backcourt work against an offensive team like the Celtics? We're going to go into the playoffs completely different backcourt than last year. Yeah, so I think Rozier, uh, as I said a little bit earlier, he's been fine defensively given expectations. He's not a lockdown defender. He's not a Gabe Vincent. He's not a Caleb Marr. And he's not a DeLon Wright, who we talked about. But I think he's been fine. For me, the bigger problem with the starting backcourt is the offense. You got two pretty ball-dominant players who like to take a lot of shots, and neither one of them likes to play off ball. So why the hell would you start those two together? I don't know. 
That's why I've been a proponent of starting Duncan Robinson because we know he is sensational off the ball and he's an improved defender. And if Terry Rozier's playmaking is going to be as nice as we've seen, then why not? Why the hell not have uh, Duncan Robinson out there catch uh, getting some open shots? Tyler Hero is not a bad off the catch and shoot player either. His numbers from three are very good, but that's not his game. He's even said that's not his game. He 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 said he's still getting used to this new role, and it's pretty clear he prefers more of a ball dominant role. So even if you're a Tyler Hero stand who wants to keep him in the starting lineup at all costs, fine. Then bench Terry Rozier. Point is. I think Duncan Robinson being the starting line because we've seen his production be incredible there and not as great coming off the bench. I think he should be uh, starting. Uh, we got a question from Jared Dickerson. He says, hey, Ant, what do you think of this starting lineup? Rozier, Duncan at the two, Caleb at three, Jimmy at the four, and Bam at the five. I don't think Jimmy would ever want to play the four. Uh, they have done, well, they haven't done this starting lineup, but Caleb has been playing the four of late with Hayward's Highsmith out, so... It's similar to what you're saying, except with Caleb at the four instead of Jimmy and Jimmy at the three. But that that's exactly what I'd want. Rozier, Duncan, Jimmy. Well, Jimmy, I probably would put Jaime Jaquez at the four. If they want to keep going offensive-minded, I think Jaime Jaquez is obviously the better offensive player. I'd like to see him there. And then off the bench, you have Tyler Hero to kind of run that unit. You have Caleb Martin, who's a guy we trust a lot. And you got Josh Richardson So the deep, and Hayward Highsmith even. So the defense on that second unit could be pretty nice as well. That's probably what I would like to see. Uh, we got my guy JC says, Tony, I've been picturing Hero coming off the bench in an attempt to bolster the defense on the starting lineup. What do you think? Oh, it depends. Do you want Duncan Robinson to start? Because then I wouldn't say your defense gets better, maybe marginally. But if not, would you want Hayward Highsmith and Caleb starting? I, I could see it. Would you want... How many Hawkeyes starting? He's not a lockdown defender, but he's better than Tyler Hero. Would you want Josh Richardson starting? I, I don't think anyone wants that, but he's been fine as well. Uh, but yeah, I, point is, Hero off the bench for, I think the offense works better. Uh, Van Lee says, you'd rather Boston early where Jimmy's fresh or Boston late giving Porzingis a chance to get banged up. I don't really like talking about uh, matches based off if I think a guy is going to get hurt or not, but you bring up a good point. Regardless, they're going to have to see Boston at one point or another, or another. If they see Boston early, early, they'll probably see Milwaukee late and vice versa. So uh, it's tough to, tough to say. Uh, Van Lee said, Terry Rozier has been living out of a hotel since coming to Miami. He'll use the all-star break to find his place. Explains his slump, kind of. Yeah, except for the fact he was slumping with Charlotte before he came to Miami. Maybe it's because he knew he was on the trading block and really wasn't all there mentally. But I, I don't know. Usually when you see a guy get to a new team, especially we know Rozier loves Miami. He said as much. That's very clear. Usually you see them kind of get out of whatever slump they're in. I haven't really seen that with him. Uh, anyways, that's the last of the comments that we got here so far. So I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. We've been going for almost 30 minutes here. But one thing I do want to say, if you're on the YouTube side, look at this number up here. This is 3,487 subscribers. The goal is to get to 5K I guess I didn't set a timeline, but the goal is get to uh, to get to 5K, and I can't do that without y'all. So if everyone tuned into this stream will hit that subscribe button for me. It does greatly do a lot for me, like a lot, as well as liking the video. If you're on the podcast side, make sure to leave five stars because that does help me out over there a lot. And make sure to come over to the YouTube side, hit subscribe over there as well. And if you're on the stream and you like the audio side more because you're driving and stuff and don't need the video, well, just go search "Believe in Miami Heat" and your local podcast platform. That's uh, Spotify, Apple Pod, uh, you know the rest of the deal. Uh, and we got one final question here before we get out from my guy Blackout. He says, one name we could have acquired at the deadline was Bull Bull. He averages eight minutes, uh, seven three, shoots 37% from three, alters the uh, shots at the rim. He can play with Bam. Listen, I wanted Bull Bull during the draft. The Heat actually did draft him, and then they traded him. And there's a reason that he hasn't been able to stick to a team. Trust me. If a guy that's 7'3", shooting 37% from three, can't stick to a team, there's a problem. Just trust me on that one. Anyways, that's all I really got to say for this video. Uh, I already told y'all to like and do all that stuff, so I won't bore you saying it again. But I do appreciate all y'all tuning in. And I'll see y'all maybe after the Heat play the Celtics tomorrow. I'm going to be cooking in preparation for the Super Bowl as well. So we'll see if I got some time. But I'll see y'all at one point or another. So. Peace out, everyone. Look, pull up in the city, tryna get that dead fast. Slash. Do it on my own, I don't need no dead weight. Like, had to kill him off, yeah, I need a headspace. You know this homegrown bitch don't offend me. Hmm.